lost the clicker. <laughs> so, Startup Nation was actually, this was a big surprise. We wrote the book in English. It was published in the United States. And we thought that would be the end of it. You know, we, we, we thought it was an, a good story, but we didn't think it was relevant to other places. So we were very surprised when, when the book came out that it started getting translated into many languages. It's out in Spanish. There's a special Latin American edition of Startup Nation. Uh, it's out in Chinese and Korean and Mongolian and French, many different languages. And what we realized was that every country wants to be innovative. That's what's going on. It's not that it's such a great book. It's that everyone wants to be innovative and they think, how do we become innovative? We need startups. And then they look, first they look to the United States. They look at Silicon Valley. And they say, wow, that's great. We want that. And then they think, oh, well, the problem is we're not the United States. You know, we can't do that. The United States, huge country. And the Israeli ambassador here told me today that uh, President Correa uh, has talked about the book Startup Nation and, and given it to all the ministers. Of course, uh, Richard, where are you? The, uh, there you are, minister. Uh, I met in Israel. We had a very good meeting. And there's a very, there's a very close connection between Ecuador and Israel. And we're very excited by that. So, uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So this is what's happening around the world. This is just some examples of all these startup organizations that different countries are creating. You know, Startup Chile, you've probably heard of Canada, many, many uh, organizations. And this just shows that every country wants startups. Um, because startups are seen as the engine of innovation and every country wants to be innovative. Go ahead, next one. So the other thing though I've noticed, I've been traveling the world for the last five years or so speaking about Israel and innovation and startups and everywhere I go, including Ecuador of course, I saw great startups here. Everywhere I see startups, this is just one map that has uh, thousands of startups in 52 different countries. Um, next slide, please. So, what's interesting about this is that we think that there's one way to do innovation, and there's many people have been look, reading the book and looking at Israel and saying, how did you do it? But the problem is that every country is different. We have a story. Our story is that we are a small country. We don't have any resources. We're in a bad neighborhood. And we decided we had to be innovative to overcome these difficulties. That's our story. Our story is about overcoming adversity, overcoming difficulties. But look at the United States. The United States is a huge country with lots of resources and friendly countries around it. Very different situation from Israel, and yet the United States built Silicon Valley. So clearly, the United States had one path to innovation, and Israel had another path. And what this shows me is that every country has its own path based on its own history, its own culture, its own geography, like the amazing things that you have in Ecuador, that you have high mountains, and you have forests, and you have uh, oceans, and you know geothermal, and all these things. Every country has its own culture, and its own history, and this is what innovation is going to be built on. Next slide, please. So, but here's the problem, is that we're blind to our own strengths. We don't realize what we're good at. We take for granted what we're good at. For example, in Israel, if you go to Israel and you talk to people, uh, high-tech companies, they'll, they'll start complaining. They'll say, oh yeah, we do startups, but why can't we build big companies? It drives Israelis crazy. 
Uh, we want, you know, they, they keep saying, you know, where's our Facebook? Where's our Google? Why, why do we only do these tiny startups? And, you know, what they don't realize is that every other country is looking at Israel and saying, why can't we do startups? Why can't we do, you know, so the Israelis don't realize that what they're doing is special. And I find that everywhere I go. Uh, next slide, please. You know, for example, when I was in Spain, everybody was complaining. They said, oh, you know, our economy is terrible. We don't know how to do startups. We don't like to take risks. We're not entrepreneurial. Meanwhile, I go back to Israel, and as I drive into Jerusalem, I drive under that bridge, which is designed by the Spanish architect, Calatrava. And I, we have three teenage daughters, and they shop. And, you know, Zara, Mango, these big Spanish brands. You know, but in Spain, they take that for granted. We couldn't build brands like that in Israel. You know, we, we don't have those strengths. So, so, one of the big problems we have is how do we actually see what we're good at? And the only way to see that is really to go outside your country and to think about you know, what are you better at that your than your neighbors are? What makes Ecuador different than the other countries around it? What makes Ecuador different than countries in Asia or whatever? Those are going to be your strengths. Next slide, please. Um, now, this is another interesting thing I noticed as I was traveling, is that we're all going through when it comes to doing innovation, we're all going through the same process. Israel went through this process, and many countries are going through it now. There are basically three stages. The first stage is you've got startups, and there's nobody to invest in them. There's no venture capital. There's, no, there's also no investment from outside, and there are no internal investors. But the startups are coming up by themselves, like from the ground. And this was happening in Israel in the, in the 1990s. And it's a very frustrating time. Because you think, how can, we, how can we get noticed? How are we going to get our first big success stories? I think it's the next slide. Uh, yeah, so the first stage is you have startups and no venture capital. The second stage is that you get your first high-profile success stories. And the third stage is when you start growing and getting more mature as a system. So let me explain what I mean by first success stories. For example, for Israel, when we talk about in the book was a, a, a company or a program called ICQ. I don't know if any of you heard of it or use it. It's a chat program. Um, that was one of the early chat programs in the very early days on the internet in the 1990s. And it was started, this company was started by a few young people in their 20s. It was a company that had no revenue, was not earning any money, but it had millions of users. And it was bought by AOL, America Online, for $400 million. And this was, like, this, this was uh, explosive in Israel. It, people in Israel saw this and said, oh my goodness, if these idiots can do it, I can do it. It was a great boost for entrepreneurship in Israel, but also it sent a signal to the rest of the world, well, look, this big American company bought this little startup. Maybe there's something going on in Israel. We better pay attention. We might miss something. So we started getting this international attention. So this is basically the, the key watershed that each country is trying to get through now. How do you get those first success stories that capture people's imagination, that attract investment, and put you on the map of innovation. Okay, so, and the third stage is after you're already gotten people's attention, then you're in a, what's called a virtuous circle, where you attract more investment, you attract more entrepreneurs, more startups, you get deeper and more mature. And I would say that there's basically only two third stage systems, innovation systems in the world today, Silicon Valley and Israel, where, the, when, where you have that depth, where you have a lot of people who've done multiple startups, keep doing it again and again, and have a lot of experience. 
most countries are in the first stage, and then I, I think there are a few, a uh, few places and countries that are in that second stage where they're getting their first sex success stories, and people are noticing them, like New York and Berlin and London. Uh, next slide, please. So these are examples of, uh, of high-profile success stories. You have Skype in Estonia, Angry Birds in Finland. Uh, Angry Birds is a game, but the company is called Rovio. I mentioned ICQ. These are examples of those kind of high-profile success stories that start putting people, putting countries on the map of innovation. Keep going. So, I want to talk for a second, though, about things that don't, bear, don't work that well in terms of promoting innovation. And what countries do when they think, okay, we have to become innovative, what should we do? And the first thing they think is, well, we want high tech, so we should build a high tech park. It looks something like that. And you know, if we build a high tech park, then high tech will move into the high tech park and we'll have startups. Um, the problem with that, though, is that startups don't usually like to be in tech parks. I have sometimes seen startups in tech parks, but when you look at where startups actually happen, it's going to be in the cool neighborhoods, it's going to be in the neighborhoods with energy, where there's, you feel there's creativity, where the rents are cheap, where people want to be, they feel like there's energy. Corporates, big companies like tech parks. So tech parks are not really the best way to get startups. Next. Uh, next yeah. So the other thing that uh, countries tend to think is, okay, we need to increase our R&D spending. And they notice that you know Israel actually spends 4.5% of its GDP on research and development which is almost double the OECD average. I mean, it's the highest in the world. But that's not because the government is so smart. The government actually never decided to do that. What happened was, because we have so many startups and so many big R&D centers from these big companies, we're able to spend so much on R&D. So the R&D spending is not a cause of the startups. It's a result. So you don't really get more startups just by spending on R&D. Next. Now, <laughs> this is another thing that countries do. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that, that it's not good. Sometimes countries need to put some money into venture capital. But again, it's very important to understand um, Venture capital investment is basically should be a private sector activity, not so much a government activity. The government can sometimes have a role in jump-starting it, in getting the private sector to come in by investing with them. But you don't want the government to be the investor, really. Why? Because it's so hard. Just like most startups fail, most investors fail. It's very hard to pick the ones that aren't going to fail. So the government governments are very bad at that. And even most of the venture funds whose job it is, whose you know their whole business is to pick good startups, they don't do very well at it either. Most of the venture funds don't do that well. Only a handful actually do very well. So you can't do this by just throwing government money at venture capital. Next. So what should countries do? Next slide, please. One example, this happens to be a picture of Tokyo, but the example I want to give is actually London, which is, I mentioned that startups like to come up just by themselves, and they don't come up in predictable places. I mean, they, they come up in these weird places like London. In London, there's an area of London that's between the Olympic Park and the uh, center of the city. Not a very nice part of town. But the startups started coming up there. Who knows why? So people started calling it Silicon Roundabout. 
And the government of London, uh, next slide please, decided to draw a circle, whoop, uh, sorry, uh, to draw a circle around that and say, this is Tech City. We're gonna call this Tech City. So it's basically a branding exercise. It was saying, instead of building a tech park and saying, the startups should come to us, the government went to the startups and said, here, here they all are, pay attention, this is Tech City. So this is a smart thing to do, and so I suggest that the government here, wherever there are startups, try to shine a light on that, give it a name, you know, pretend that you did it yourself, and just promote it. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, another important, very important thing that government can do that is often neglected is simply stop doing things that are a problem for startups. Um, if you talk to entrepreneurs, if any of you here are entrepreneurs, you, I'm sure there are things that the government is doing, whether it's taxes or bureaucracy or regulations that is making your life more difficult. Governments can help you, perhaps even more than giving you money, is if they just stop doing those things that are holding you back. So it's very, very important for governments to not only to think of how can we spend money on this, but how can we do things that don't cost anything, just stop doing things that are harmful. And then there's a lot of benefit that could be uh, uh, for, the, for the startups and innovation by doing that. Uh, next slide. Another amazing thing that governments can do is governments have things that can really help startups. The next slide, please. Um, three things I'll mention. One is governments have data. Data is like oxygen for startups. Many, many startups in different places are built around government data. Because when you can see what's happening around you, you can build an app or you can do something to make that more efficient, to build a business around it. So, but governments have the data and they don't let it go. Now, I would strongly recommend that you copy. I'm actually, I think that Israel should do this too and Israel is actually doing this. We need to all copy the UK. The United Kingdom created this amazing system uh, where they, they put all the government data online, they're very open, and they, uh, they're streamlining to basically make it so everybody can get all the government services over the internet and so on and so forth. And this is all open source. The UK has just put their whole, all their whole system, all the code is online for anybody to take it. Any government can do what they're doing. And I hope that I'm trying to get the government of Israel to do this, to simply take what the UK has done and do it themselves. Ecuador can do this too. Korea has done it. New Zealand has done it. Estonia is very advanced in this. This is something that doesn't cost money and it saves tons of money because it turns out that government services are very expensive. And if you're able to give government services over the internet, you both save the government a lot of money and you make people's lives a lot easier. So, and the last thing I'm gonna get back to is the biggest idea in some ways that I'm most excited about, which is that countries can basically become a platform for innovation themselves. And I call this moonshots, where basically a country decides we're not just gonna do things a little bit better, we're gonna try to reinvent something and do it much better than everybody else. The original moonshot, of course, was John F. Kennedy saying we're gonna land on the moon. It was setting a very a crazy goal and setting a deadline. So governments can do that. They can say we're gonna reinvent healthcare, we're gonna reinvent education, we're gonna do it by this date. And that encourages a lot of people to get involved in a specific area. I think that's uh, a very powerful engine for innovation. Next. But this, this is something huge. I just added this slide like yesterday. Um, 
And I think it's really one of the most important things. And this is what I'm going to suggest uh, in my meetings later with government officials. I think that Ecuador has to capture people's imagination. In a way, what I'm talking about is a, is a country version of what ICQ did. It's something big that puts you on the map, that shows everybody, both Ecuadorians and the rest of the world, that here is an innovative country. And this means big projects. And Yachai is one of those projects. I and mean, that's exactly the idea of this place, is we are going to, we're not just going to say we want to move to a knowledge economy, we're going to build a whole city around that idea. But I would encourage you to go a step further, because I think that Yachai should not only be innovative in that it's a new city, and that it's built around knowledge, but that it's a new kind of city. I think it should be a car-less city, no cars. And I think that it should be a city, there's, uh, I didn't, yes I did, I did add a slide. Next slide, please. This is something called SkyTrain. It's a transportation system. It's a, each one of those things holds two people. And they can go, when they're going between cities, they can go 200 kilometers an hour when they're going in cities, let's say 60 kilometers an hour. And this is a way to deal with the congestion in Quito. If you build a line like this between Quito and Yachai, instead of two and a half, three hours, it will take half an hour to get here. And this is not science fiction. This is system is going to be built in Israel. It's going to be built in India. It's going to be, and it could be built in Ecuador. And th this is the kind of thing that could be a game changer. Um, and this is the kind of thing that, that le takes you a step up past everybody else. It doesn't just catch up with everybody else. You go past everybody else. And the only thing stopping this, there's no, there's no technology obstacle to this. The only thing that would prevent you from doing this is not money either. There's going to be plenty of money you're going to be spending on subway systems and highways. And for, this costs less than those things. So money is not an obstacle. It's all a matter of political will and uh, the ability to actually get it done bureaucratically and politically. And either you have it or you don't. And the countries that have it will be able to do this first, could be Ecuador, and the countries that don't will be later on. But this kind of thing could be transformative for this country. And I think if you happen to be one of the first countries to do this, it would instantly put you on the map of innovation. Uh, I, I didn't mention in the previous slide, two examples. Startup Chile. You know, you guys probably all know that Chile is paying people $40,000 to come to Chile and do their startup. You know, that simple idea capture people's imagination. It doesn't cost a lot of money, but it said, it said like, put up a big sign, Chile it wants startups. So that was very smart. Another thing, I was in Medellin. There was a contest the other day, online contest, what is the most innovative city in the world? And the finalists were New York, Tel Aviv, and Medellin. And Medellin won. Why did Medellin win? win? Because I was there. I was at the Biblioteca in, uh, in this uh, very, very poor neighborhood up on the mountain uh, uh, Medellin. And they built a transit system. Again, transportation changing everything. They built a, a transit system. They put these masterpiece pieces of architecture in the middle of a uh, favela. And, and this was like crazy. And people said, wow, this is, this is really creative. And you know, so Medellin now has this reputation of being one of the most innovative places in the world. So this shows how capturing imagination is critical. And just being a new city in Ecuador isn't enough. Uh, I, I think you have to do something even more. And I, I think actually you're going to have a problem 
attracting the numbers of people you want here if it's not easy to get to Quito. If you can't get to Quito. Because to be an Inopolis, what does it mean to be an Inopolis? It's basically a matter of people. Uh, give some examples of what it means for how do you how do you actually build co-innovate? How do you innovate? How do you build a company in two different countries? Um, this is just one example. Uh, the word missing there is Ghana. Uh, great guy, a friend of mine named Greg Roxon is from Ghana. He's building a startup that's. Uh, how would you like this? Instead of going to the doctor to get a prescription, you just take your phone to the pharmacy and you, they give you what you need. In other words, let doctors write digital prescriptions. Pretty basic. It's called m -Pharma. It's actually a huge idea. It's got a lot of other implications. But he's, he's from Ghana and he wants to roll this out in Africa. And he's doing it right now in three African countries. But he's building a startup in Israel. His developers are in Israel. So this is a great example of building a startup in Israel and Ghana and other countries. It's co-innovation. Next slide, please. Um, here's another one a bit closer. This is an Israeli company. Uh, some guys from uh, an intelligence unit that we talk about in the book, a book, uh, very interesting unit called the 8200 unit that spends a lot of time trying to uh, track people of the internet and so on. People coming from that unit, uh, a bunch of them who, who like to play games, they thought, hey, we can actually do education through games because if you take a game like chess, a strategy game, you're learning all these things that we wish we learned in school. Don't we wish we learned about decision making, emotional intelligence, decision making, all these things in school? We're not learning those things, but we need them in life. And you can teach those things through strategy games. So this was a tiny Israeli company that was going nowhere, basically, until a Brazilian found them. And he said, this is great, I want to take it to Brazil. And he figured out how to convince the Brazilian school system to adopt this. The Israelis would never have been able to figure that out. So this company, which now may be a global company, would not exist, basically, if it weren't for a huge Brazilian part of the innovation and a huge Israeli part, both sides doing what they're best at. Next. Skype. I mean, this is a successful company. The founders from Skype come from four different countries. There were seven founders that came from the United States, Sweden, Denmark, and Estonia. Next, please. So, we need to combine our strengths. Uh, we can do this, and the way to do it, I think, is we need to start connecting with the people around us. Uh, and for a country like Ecuador, I think it means two things. One is to start paying attention to the startups in countries around you. I mean, the easiest way to start is with startups in your own region. In, in uh, Ecuador's case, they even speak the same language. They're not so far away. And you'll find whole worlds of great entrepreneurs and great ideas right near you. And basically, Instead of trying to get critical mass only in Ecuador, do it regionally. Because the region is going to get a uh, quick critical mass quicker. And I promise you that every, any country, and even maybe every country company that does a better job of this, is more likely to succeed. Um, next slide, please. So build teams across countries. You're going to get uh, more of those high-profile success stories, and you're going to reach that critical mass faster uh, and get to that stage three ecosystem. Next slide, please. So I want to I want to finish with this. Um, you know, Israel is very far away, <laughs> but so Brazil is also very far away from Israel. And that I, was, I gave you an example of how you know a, a company could be built in Brazil and Israel. Companies can also be built in Brazil, in Ecuador and Israel. 
And I would also, yeah, that's my email, by the way. <laughs> I don't have any cards, but you don't need my card because you got my email. Um, that, you know, everybody wants to be in Silicon Valley. But I think it's important for us to think that it may actually be an advantage not to be in Silicon Valley. Because think about it. You know, the rest of the world is actually growing faster than the United States, than the U.S. market. It's bigger than the U.S. market. And there are more interesting problems that need solving outside the United States. I mean, how many apps do we need to find a better restaurant? We're kind of running out of rich country problems. The more interesting and important problems are outside of the United States, of Europe, even of Israel. And that's why it's important for Israelis to get out the door to countries like Ecuador that know and meet great entrepreneurs here and figure out great problems to solve with these entrepreneurs together. And this needs to be done. And the only way to make this happen is to go back and forth. So I really encourage you to visit Israel. Uh, I wish there were a direct flight. I, it, uh, it's not a direct flight, but it's sort of direct through Madrid. You can go. Uh, nice connection. Um, great beaches, warm place. You'll love it there. And what's great about it is you'll show up in Israel and you'll feel, if you're an entrepreneur, you'll feel at home instantly. Why? Because here's a place where it's normal to be an entrepreneur. How great is that? You know? That's, what, that's why people like to go to Silicon Valley. You know, because there's so much going on. So Israel is a place like that. So you should, you know, try to find a way to come to Israel. And we need to get more Israelis coming to Ecuador. Because what happens is the way this happens is when you meet people you're excited about, and you see great problems to solve that excite you, you're going to start working together. You can't, and, and, and that's how also we, we overcome this problem of how do you start? Like, like maybe you're thinking, oh yeah, I want to do something with Israel, but how do you start? Well, you start by meeting people. And it works both ways. Uh, so I just want to say that, again, that Ecuador can do this, that this is a kind of a global race that's going on, we don't know who the leaders will be in, in Latin America. We don't know who the innovation leader will be. You know, will it be Peru, will it be Ecuador, will it be Chile, will it be, who knows? You can't tell by the size of the country. You can't tell by the economic situation. I mean, who would have guessed that Israel would become an innovation leader 20 years ago? There was no way you could have guessed that. So the race is on, anybody can win it. And, uh, and I, I really encourage you to, to connect with us. So I hope to see you in Israel or when I come back to Ecuador. Thank you.